Fleshed out the wonder of life And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breath The planets form And if the stars remain to worship so loud I can see your heart in everything you make Every burning star signal fire grace And if creation sings your praises so down my heart through all of my failure and pride on a hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die and as you speak 
Hello, hello. Hi, Cameron. Hi, Carla. Hey, Catherine. Hey, Dina. Hey, Emily. I'm Steve. Hi, Holly. George, Kellen, and Graham. Hey, I can't say hi to all of you personally, but I can't even see all your names. Hey, though, I'm Steve. I'm the senior pastor of Reservoir Church. It may say Matt on my screen. Don't let that fool you. My name's Steve. I am glad to be welcoming you to our online worship. And today, this last Sunday of September at Reservoir Church, we welcome everyone without exception, including each of you, to discover the love of Jesus, the joy of living, and the gift of community. My hope and prayer is that our online service today will help each of us connect with uh, some of all of that a little bit more. Um, our order of service this week is that I am going to uh, say a few announcements in a minute. Uh, Matt will lead us in a song. Uh, we'll have a short uh, prayer practice. Uh, I'll share a message, a sermon today. Uh, there'll be prayers of the people, an opportunity for you through our chat to make your prayers known and for us to pray together, a uh, closing song and a final blessing from me. And we will be done before noon. Uh, now that I'd love to share a few announcements about things going on in this community, some in person, some online, some both thereof. Um, the first is a little class that I'm teaching starting next Sunday night. I'll be teaching a series of classes now and then in this a series called Unpacking Christianity. This one is called After Evangelicalism. A uh, friend of mine, much more uh, famous uh, than me named David Gushy, wrote a great book called After Evangelicalism, The Path to a New Christianity. Uh, my preaching uh, about a year ago was based from that book, had a lot of interest in diving into that together. And so for five Sunday evenings, each Sunday in October, uh, we'll have a discussion rooted in this book on some of the past challenges of American Christianity, particularly American evangelical Christianity, and more importantly, some ideas of where Christian faith is headed, where it can be headed for you and me. Uh, there's a re uh, link here for you to register for the class. That'll give you the Zoom link for all five days. If you can't figure out how to make that link work or have questions, you can email me, steve at reservoirchurch.org. Uh, David Gushy, the author of this book, is going to be coming by one week to join us and chat with us. Uh, you do not have to read the book. It's recommended. I think you get more out of it. But if you don't want to buy or read a book, that's totally fine, too. You're welcome. If you got questions, let me know. Otherwise, sign up. We start a week from today in the evening. Uh, secondly, if you are new to this community, or you've been around for a little while, but you've not made a lot of connections, you're still feeling new, we would love to hear from you. We've got a simple form here uh, on your screen in the chat that if you click that, you can just share a few things about yourself, and one of our pastors can say hello, uh, answer questions if you have them, uh, let you know that we are glad that you're here. Um, another great thing you can do if you're feeling new is that you could get connected with one of our community groups. We've got about 30 groups, some of which meet solely online, some of which in person, many of which use both of those formats. Um, that would be a great place for you to meet a few folks in this community and feel more connected. Uh, Pastor of Community Life, Ivy, ivy at reservoirchurch.org, would love to help match make you with the group if that interests you. Uh, lastly, uh, if you consider Reservoir your church, we would love for you to become a member if you haven't. Our membership's about belonging, not believing. It's a way of saying, this is my church. I belong here, and I'm going to participate in the life of this community, like as a guest, but also as a host, too, as someone that belongs here and helps make this community happening. Uh, to become a member, all you need to do is fill out this form you see on your screen and in the chat. And we'll follow up with you and let you know we're so glad you're here. If you're not ready to do that and have questions, any of our pastors would love to talk to you more about any questions you may have about this church. A lot of other ways to get involved here. You're welcome to try any or all of them. A good start is to subscribe to our weekly newsletter if you haven't yet, so you can get all the events and happenings that we have to offer. You can easily find that on our website. So good to be with you. Let me pray and then turn over to Matt for our opening song. Our God of beautiful days, our God of new beginnings, could today be a beautiful day in our lives? Could you give us eyes to see, as Jesus liked to say, um, the goodness around us today and the way that this too can be a joyful, good day? And God, if any, any ways that we need a new beginning in our lives today as well, could you, God of new beginnings, lead us into that? Lead us into some good news and some hope wherever we need it today. Amen. 
All right, Matt. Morning, everybody. Well, this is fun, sliding into the picture. Um, morning, my name's Matt. So good to be with all 40 of us today. Hey, let me shout out a few people. Hey, Crystal. Hey, Emily. Hey, Gloria. Hey, Jeff and Carl. Hey, Peter. Hey, Scott. Um, well, I'm here to sing a song, but before I do that, I just wanted to tell you all. Um, I, I didn't want to tell you. I wanted to say um, thanks for hanging with us um, as we, the staff at Reservoir, figure out um, how to do both an in-person service on that stage behind me um, and an online service. It might, it might have felt a little janky these past couple of weeks with the switch through to 11 a.m. Um, and different uh, configurations are sliding on and off screen. Um, stuff like that. We haven't forgotten about the online service. We haven't forgotten about any of you. I'm really excited to be building a little mini broadcasting studio um, in the basement uh, that we're going to move to as soon as it's ready, as soon as it's got internet. Um, we're investing in our online service, um, even now that it is moderately safe uh, to come and worship in person, um, because we think that Online worship is part of the future um, of how we do church in the 21st century, and that means you. Um, so I just wanted to say that and invite you to pray for us um, as we try to like put internet into a really old building, as we try to figure out new ways of doing this beautiful online service that we have invested in um, these past 18 months. Okay, that's all the talking. Let's sing a song together. I invite you to sing with me. This is I'll Give Thanks. Yeah, in the morning. In the morning you sing over me. I receive your mercy Your faithfulness is clear to see Constant every day Sing that again in the morning In the morning you sing over me And I receive your mercy Faithfulness is clear to see Like the sunrise Is constant every day Every breath Every breath I breathe An invitation To believe you are creating Something good Though this season doesn't tell my story, I know you'll move mountains for me. You're just that good, so I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough. Cause you're more than enough, and you know what I need, so I'll give thanks to God. When I don't have enough Cause you're more than enough And you know what I need In the silence I choose In the silence I choose to Working in the waiting And though the future isn't clear to me No I trust you anyway Every breath 
every breath I breathe an invitation to believe you are creating something good though this season doesn't tell my story I know you'll move mountains for me you're just that good so I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough cause you're more than enough and you know what I need so I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough cause you're more than enough and you know what I need Why do I worry? Why do I worry? Why do I worry? Why do I worry? Cause God knows what I need. Why do I worry? Why do I worry? Why do I worry? God knows what I need. So I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough cause you're more than enough and you know what I need so I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough cause you're more than enough and you know what I need oh you know what I need So our loving God, we invite you this morning to release us from worry, from anxiety, plenty to go around. Help us to trust, Lord. Help us to rest in the shadow of your wings. Help us to believe, because that's the work disciples to believe. Thank you for being with us wherever we are this morning. Amen. Thanks for singing with me, friends. I'm going to make some space for Lydia. Here she comes. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Lydia Shu, one of the pastors here, and I'll be leading us through a spiritual practice today. So the fall series we're entering into uh, today is called The Table, How Jesus Gathers. It will explore the stories of Jesus around tables, uh, primarily stories from Luke and other places too, highlighting not only Jesus's amazing ministry of meals, but also what occurred at these tables. Who was invited? Whose tables did Jesus sit at? What was the shape of those tables? What were the tables set with? What was Jesus flipping, reordering? And in all of this, how Jesus is inviting us to gather together around the table to create and grow a beloved community here. So each Sunday in this series, we will engage in a spiritual practice called Visio Divina, which means divine seeing. It's a way in which we prayerfully invite God to speak to us and to stir our hearts as we look at an image. The image itself may be ordinary, but it's a way to slow down, focus, and stay with the image as we search our own hearts, minds, and body for what comes up for us as we engage and take this image in. So each week for the season, we'll have one image that represents a table. As we move along, you'll notice that these tables are both physical and metaphorical, since Jesus was inviting us to consider both. 
Today's image will come up on your screen in just a moment. Um, please utilize this image as a way to engage with God and also utilize it as a gateway to see more of God in the real world around you, in your own life, your neighborhoods, and your own tables. It's a way to unlock and unfold a deeper knowing of God's love in your real settings. So now I invite you to just take a moment to be with God, maybe find yourself in a prayer posture. Uh, you can feel free to take some deep breaths, relax, maybe uh, sit on the ground if you'd like. And you'll see an image come up on your screen. Hold the image in your mind for a few moments. Let the image sink into your heart or gaze at the image softly. Let the image take you in. Notice how it makes you feel in your body. Notice what emotions might be stirring in you. I'll give us a few moments of silence and lead you through some prompting questions uh, to take you through some reflection and meditation. Feel free to close your eyes uh, as, as I lead through some questions to prompt you for reflection or gaze the image softly. What were meals like for you growing up? Who were the folks often at your table? What feelings were at the table? How did you feel? How did the other people feel at the table? Your parents or siblings, family members? Try not to overthink or analyze or judge the thoughts or memories that come to mind. Just be with it. Just notice. As you take in this image and the memories and the feelings that conjured up within you, rolling through your mind and your spirit, ask God to be at that table with you. Let me pray for us. God, who invites us all and calls us to your simple presence, Help us to take a seat and learn from you. May we pull up a chair and sit near you, see you, and be changed forever in all that we do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Lydia. It's fun for us who are leading the service today to be sharing some space Together, I hope you didn't hear me chomping on my apple in the background while Lydia led us through that wonderful practice. It's good to be sharing some 
words with you today. I've been thinking a lot about the place I come from. It's interesting to, as an adult, look back to what was going on around you as a kid with new insight. Now, in the 70s and 80s, right where I lived, there were these enormous religious controversies playing out around me. I ran track with a kids of the professors of a local divinity school, and these teammates' dads were shaping the direction of conservative Christianity in this country, I realized later. Now, my mom also taught in the preschool that I went to as a kid where this major debate about church life in this area was going on. I had no idea, of course, as a kid that these things were happening at the time, but I think about them a lot these days. There's a prominent author named Diana Butler Bass, and recently she wrote about what happened in the 80s at the church that housed the preschool I went to. That church's denomination was arguing about whether or not women could be pastors or priests, and they were arguing about the language and their worship and prayers as well that had to do with this topic of women's leadership too. This was part of a whole series of church controversies in the 70s and 80s that evolved and continued and gave birth to some of what um, many of us least like about churches in America today. And anyway, right in my little hometown area of Hamilton, Massachusetts, there was a heated meeting in a church over whether, um, over this issue and where the bishop, the person in charge of all the local churches that denomination met with a group of loud and angry men who were questioning the changes that were happening. And one of the men, a particularly loud and rigid guy, stood up and challenged the bishop. He raised his voice and said, you, sir, are a bishop, and it's your job to guard the gospel. What do you even think the gospel is? This man was Diana Butler Bass's first husband, and she was shaken and humiliated by this moment. Uh, later, they would divorce. But the bishop took it in stride. To his challenge about the gospel, he simply answered, God is love. To this, his challenger was like, yeah, sure, but what is the gospel? And again, the bishop said, God is love. And God loves everybody. God loves everybody. This is the good news of God given to us in Jesus Christ, or it is at least the very important start of it. God loves everybody. This week, as you've heard, we get going in our fall series, The Table, How Jesus Gathers. And today, I begin with this message, God loves everybody, asking who gets to be at Jesus' table, and what happens when we're there? It's another way of asking, with a different tone, the question that man asked, what is the gospel? What is God's good news spoken to us and lived out for us too by Jesus Christ? And how does that come alive to us still? I'd like to read today's passage about Jesus. It's from the fifth chapter of Luke's stories about Jesus' life. It's also called the gospel or the good news, according to Luke. It goes like this. Afterward, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at a kiosk for collecting taxes. Jesus said to him, follow me. Levi got up, left everything behind and followed him. And then Levi threw a great banquet for Jesus in his home. A large number of tax collectors and others sat down to eat with him. The Pharisees and their legal experts grumbled against his disciples. They said, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. I didn't come to call righteous people, but sinners to change their hearts and lives. So I want to start with a little who's who in this passage. And then after the who's who, we'll ask what sin, who's a sinner, and why is that who Jesus loves? And then lastly, like who gets to be at the table with Jesus? And how can that experience affect us? First, the who's who. Uh, we've got in this uh, scene, Levi, who's a tax collector. We've got Pharisees who don't like Levi very much. And then we've got Jesus. Uh, tax collectors were considered sellouts. They were uh, collaborators with the Roman Empire's colonization of Judea, and they made their living by overcharging and extortion. So hardly fan favorites amongst their fellow Jews for a bunch of very good reasons. If Levi had seen a young upstart rabbi coming over to visit his tax collection storefront, he might have expected he was going to get a lecture. Like, young Levi, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing to our people? He certainly wouldn't have expected a recruiting visit. But that's what happens. Jesus says, follow me, which was like saying, be my student. Join this movement. 
kind of like a church membership pitch, I guess. And this means Jesus is also following him. For whatever reason, Jesus has taken an interest in Levi. He knows his name, he knows his family, his circumstances, his potential. Afterwards, Levi takes an interest in following Jesus, being a student, sitting at his table. The first table they sit at together isn't Jesus's, though. It's Levi's, Levi's tax collection table. And then it's the big table in Levi's home. Again, when you follow Jesus, you find that Jesus is really following you, wanting to be where you work, where you live, to accompany you there. Levi throws a party in Jesus' honor to celebrate their new connection. Outside the party, pissed off and grumbling about what's happening there, are a group Luke calls the Pharisees and their legal experts. The Pharisees come up as a group now and then, and they usually seem like Jesus' enemies. At least that's how Christians have usually talked about them. There are two problems with this way of talking about the Pharisees, though. One, it's anti-Semitic, and two, Jesus just might have been one of them. Let's take the less surprising part first, the anti-Semitism. Uh, the Pharisees' writings and reforms during this time, they become the basis of what eventually became modern-day Judaism. We're oversimplifying a long story a little, but that is basically true. And for most of Christians' 2,000-year history, Christian people and institutions have been brutally and violently anti-Jewish. Even though Jesus and almost all of his first followers, almost all of the writers of the Christian Bible were Jews. So to cast these Pharisees who shaped what Judaism has become today as the villains of the Christian story is to risk sliding right into this old hateful pattern. The Pharisees are not the enemy. They are much more than that. There's also a really good chance, as I said, that at one point in his life, Jesus was a Pharisee, or he at least shared lots in common with them. The Pharisees were a reform movement in the culture and religion of Jesus' time. They believed God was a loving father, that God loved humanity so much, God gave humanity the law, the scriptures, so that everyone who followed them would have connection with God and all God's benefits in this life and in the life to come, what they sometimes called eternal life. Jesus shared the Pharisees' devotion of scripture. He shared their love of worship and the gift of rest they called Sabbath. Jesus, too, loved the gifts of God was giving the world through the Jewish people. And like them, he believed God is a loving parent and emphasized a life of prayer and devotion to God. In many ways, the Pharisees were Jesus' people. And Jesus got into arguments with them all the time, not because they were his opposite, but because he was so close, but they were starting to part ways. He was a more radical version of one of them. They knew each other. They shared common foundations, and Jesus wanted way, way more from their movement. Where Jesus and his contemporary Pharisees parted ways were that they had a really different sense of who belongs at God's table and how you get there. Who belongs at God's table and how you get there. These uh, divergences, they were really important to Jesus. These topics got Jesus angry like not much else did. And we see this divergence playing out at Levi's table too. So let's talk about that. How you get to God's table. For Jesus, you do not earn your spot there. That is impossible. And think about it beyond just Jesus. Like who really earns anything that matters most in life? Who could earn love and affection from a parent. It's there or it's not, freely given as it should be or not. Who could earn most of what's most valuable in life? And who could earn a spot at God's table? Who could earn God's attention? Who could earn like a follow from God? I say this word like a follow from God because there's something interesting with this word follow going on in this passage. So Jesus invites Levi to follow him, to be his student, to join the circle of people he's teaching, to pay attention to him. But what this means is that Jesus was also first following Levi, as I said. Like Jesus paid attention to Levi first. Jesus was interested in Levi's life and reputation. Jesus didn't only see him as a tax collector. Jesus saw more and Jesus took the initiative. Uh, years ago, when my wife Grace and I uh, and our kids, too, uh, first started getting on Instagram. The feature that we hated most was how the follows work there. 
right? On Instagram, you can follow someone and they can never follow you back. And kids all the time, we realize we're following someone on Instagram, waiting for the person to follow them back and then unfollowing them right away. Because it was part of this whole hustle to like look cool by having more followers than the amount of people that you follow. And there are all kinds of interesting scams, I guess, that our kids and maybe grownups too use to like work these number counts. And, and it's gross. Sorry to be a little opinionated here. It's gross, right? Because it's using each other. It's a way of using each other, like build up our own status while dropping other people's down. And God is not like this at all. God would rather follow more people than God has followers. In fact, God follows everyone. God takes an intimate interest in creation. Like God, like clicking around, like, I want to see that. Uh, oh, I want to know all about that. I follow you. I follow you. I follow you. Like God loves everyone. God is fascinated by everything God made. And God pays attention to everything and everyone. God is like a universal follower. God follows us all, whether or not we follow God back. This is how we get to God's table, through God's loving, attentive knowledge of us, through God being curious about our lives, and then through God's invitation to pay attention in return, to follow God back. Who belongs at God's table? As far as God's concerned, everyone. God loves everybody. God loves everybody. <laughs> Jesus puts a little twist on the everyone here, though. He says, oh, there's one group of people he may follow, but he's not really expecting them to follow him back. That's okay. He's not calling to them. He's not knocking on the door or anything. He's not going to bug them because he says, I didn't come to call righteous people, but sinners. He says, I'm like a doctor. Healthy people, they don't reach out very much. But sick people, they are always welcome. I am here for them. What's a sinner? For most of us, sin is what we judge other people for. I know this, by the way, because people show me this all the time. I'm sure none of you, <laughs> no one on Reservoir Online at this moment, but sometimes someone who is frustrated with our church, maybe realizing that Reservoir is not for them or thinking about leaving or on their way out, they'll ask to meet with me and ask me why I don't talk more about sin. I'm kind of confused when this happens, by the way, since I think I talk about sin a lot. So I'll ask them, help me understand what is wrong in your life that you wish your church would talk about more. And sometimes they're confused by my question. So I'll keep going. I'll ask, um, where have you lost your way? What unhealthy patterns in you would you like to confess to me? What are you doing to hurt yourself? Uh, hurt others? What are you doing maybe even to hurt God that you need your church to speak about more often? And then they'll be like, oh, oh no, I didn't mean me. I meant, and like, there'll be a fill in the blank, but they will in fact fill in the blank. They'll be like, I meant these people. And they'll talk about something other people do that they wish their church would take a stand on, that they wish their church would criticize with more clarity. And I'm like, oh, no, we're not going to do that. All the best. See, this is sin as a category for stuff we judge other people for. Now, whether we're conservative or liberal, or whether we don't like either of those words, whether we are religious or not, we're kind of prone to this. Maybe it's the human condition to want to justify ourselves by looking down on others. Certainly, this has sort of become the American way to locate all the bad in the world in people not like us. This, by the way, is not at all what Jesus is talking about. Part of Jesus's radicality, part of where he parted ways with his fellow Pharisees too, was his refusal to do this. It was his call to humility and introspection. He had this profoundly non-judgmental, humble way of thinking about sin. But you know, when that word comes up, it's sort of like time to look in the mirror, not look at anyone else. Sin, after all, it's just, it's where we've lost our way, any and all of us. Sin isn't about a pointed finger. It's about those three fingers, literally, and kind of metaphorically pointing back at us. 
Sin isn't like a pair of poop-stained critical glasses through which we see the world. Sin is a word for our time in the mirror. It's an invitation to see ourselves more truthfully. Sin is what's in us that isn't healthy, that needs healing and repair. Sin is how we hurt others and hurt ourselves. Sin is how we puff ourselves up too big or even how we knock ourselves down to make ourselves too small. And sin isn't just personal like this. Sin is collective. Sin is structural too. We'll talk about those things later this fall, I'm sure. But all of the sin, all the parts that are wrong with us, all this makes God love us even more. What's wrong with us doesn't in any way reduce God's love for us. God loves everyone. And God especially loves self-aware sinners. It's not just sin, though, that evokes God's affection and attention. Sin is only half of this doctor metaphor Jesus uses. We also need healing for how we've lost our way, but also for how our path has been derailed by others. We need healing for how we've screwed up, but also for how others or just life has screwed us over. We have hurt ourselves and others, but we have been profoundly hurt as well. And all of this too, God sees with loving affection. Jesus' invitation to Levi and to all of us to follow him is so different from our usual ways that we think about all these things. Maybe our usual ways we think about self-improvement. We're always trying to justify ourselves, to make ourselves look or feel better than we are. And when that fails and we confront our mistakes and wounds, our failings and our hurts, we may not have much hope for any of all that to be accepted or to change it all. So we try and kind of cover up and hide our crap, you know, all the parts of us that we aren't very proud of. But Jesus comes alongside us and is like, I follow you. I know you. I see you. I see how you've lost your way. I see how you've been hurt. We're all sinners, just like we've all been sinned against. And that need, that lack, that ache, it makes us eligible to sit at God's table, to be in relationship with the God who loves us. This past week, I was thinking about all this as I finally started watching Ted Lasso. I have friends who've been going on and on about that show. I have felt kind of left out. I did not know who this man was. <laughs> Matt is into the show. Okay, It's about an American football coach who becomes like a British football you know, soccer coach. Uh, a gem of a human in my community group uh, baked and boxed Ted Lasso style biscuits for everybody in the group one week, which was the most thoughtful, delicious thing to do for your friends. And maybe the most effective TV show promotion I have ever experienced as well. And Bakken, if you are on today, do not be surprised when Apple TV comes calling. Anyway, based on this whole biscuit deal, I binged a whole bunch of Ted Lasso this past week. And man, is it a delightful show. It's a show about a lot of things and it's just warm and funny, but it in many ways, it is also a show about this God loves everybody thing I'm talking about today, about how the kindness, grace, and acceptance of God can start to propel healing in us, whether we've been hurt or have hurt, whether the thing we see in us is our sin or how we've been sinned against us. Uh, you get this relentlessly optimistic Coach Lasso, who eventually, with the help of what I'll call God and the help of friends, can confront some of the pain in his life. And you get a variety of other characters who through love and acceptance start to find freedom to confront how they have lost their way and made a mess of themselves and others and get some freedom to uh, restart that or do better. I watched the show, I have to admit, sometimes through tears as I thought about how both sides of this coin are me too. And they're also pretty much everyone I know and care about too. We've all have our ways that we've lost. We all have our ways we've been broken and hurt. We all have spaces where we've lost our ways, where we've let the worst parts of ourselves be in charge. And all of us, when we're seen with kindness and acceptance and truth, we can find there are healing paths forward. We don't have to be stuck. We can get better. This is Jesus's way with us. He's not walking around uh, following people per se, like stopping by their workplaces to get to know them, sitting at the tables in our home. Uh, our world had Jesus of Nazareth walking around doing these things for one short lifetime many, many years ago. 
But now Jesus is available and present just how God is through the spirit of God, the same spirit Jesus called his spirit, the one who comes alongside us that will know God is with us and know God's acceptance and know God's power within to change and to heal. Sometimes this spirit of God comes to us felt but unseen. Uh, sometimes spirit comes to us through other people and events and through the creation around us. Wherever kindness speaks to you, though, wherever a voice is saying to us, I see you, I know you, I want to follow you, that's in part spirit of God. Wherever we're told, like, let's be friends, let's be at the table together, that, too, is in part spirit of God. Because spirit of God wants to communicate to us, God is love. God loves everybody. God has space and attention for you and me. And when God sees what's wrong with us, when God sees the hurts and the hurting, the sin and the sinned against, the losing our way for whatever reason, when God sees that, God loves us even more. And in that loving acceptance, God has ideas for how we find our way forward again. If you're willing, I'd love to leave you with a little experiment to try this week. I invite you to find a quiet moment, maybe today, tomorrow, or you can sit somewhere by yourself. If it helps, sit at a table or on a couch with another empty chair so you can imagine what by faith we believe is true, that God is with you there. Tell God anywhere in your life that you've lost your way, what is breaking or broken in you, where you've hurt or been hurt, your sin or your pain, whatever seems most important. And then as you do that, try two things. First, imagine God looking at you with loving acceptance, maybe putting a hand on your shoulder and saying, I hear you, I see you, it's okay, I'm here. And sit there and lean into the loving acceptance of God. And then when you're ready, ask God, ask the spirit of Jesus, is there anything I can do to find my way again with you? Any next step forward for me to participate with you, God, in my healing? And see what comes to mind. And if it seems truthful and helpful, give it a try. Friends, God loves us just as we are. And with God's loving acceptance, God wants to keep helping us find our way forward too. Matt, do you want to pick up our prayers? All right, I'm going to turn over to Matt. Matt's going to lead us in prayer now as we hear one another's concerns. Good being with y'all. Hello again, friends. I'm going to lead us this morning um, in a moment of prayer uh, that we like to call prayers of the people. It's what many tr Christian traditions call this kind of thing. Um, it's a way for us to pray collectively for our communities um, and also uh, to hear and hold our individual prayer requests. It's one of the most beautiful things I think about churches is that we get to bear one another's burdens and sorrows and celebrate um, in one another's triumphs um, and moments of praise. So uh, we're going to take a few moments of silence in a bit. Um, we're going to pray through some prayers together. And I will invite you to respond to each sentence, which will be up on slides, um, using the words, God, hear our prayer. I invite you to say that out loud, wherever you are. Um, and then after that, I invite you to share your own prayer requests, if you would like to, in the chat. Um, and it's cool uh, to share them with the whole community um, so I can read them out. So if your chat says everyone, everyone will be able to see it. Um, and that's kind of the intention here. We want to share uh, in each other's burdens and sorrows and celebrate um, in joy as well. Okay, the slides will be up on your screen in just a second. Let's take a few moments of silence in peace. We pray to you, O oh God.
for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for all those who are alone, we pray. God, hear our prayer. For this community, our neighborhoods and cities and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, God, hear our prayer. of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. God, hear our prayer. And for those who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for the peace and unity for us all who seek to live and breathe and have our being centered on the love of Jesus, neighbor, and self. God, hear our prayer. And so, friends, as you're ready, please add your prayers to the chat. To read them together. Prayer for individual and collective healing of traumas. Yeah, Lord, hear our prayer. Prayer that my list is not too big for God. For Tally, who was diagnosed with stage four cancer. I'm praying for a miracle. Mm, for the migrants from Haiti and the suffering they've endured in their home country and here in the U.S. Our Lord, hear our prayer. To heal from trauma and move on to a safer place. For a friend struggling and trying to make big life decisions. Healing for Ryan's foot injury. Prayer for faith to believe and receive all that God has for us. Yes. Prayer for those bound up in legalism and the unconditional love and that the unconditional love of God would permeate them and calm their fears of inadequacy. Yes. Ruby, that you would find a new job soon. Prayer for relief of anxieties. Hmm. Prayers for a badger, an adult dog. And Holly, your worry. Lord, hear our prayer. For everyone that's having a hard time and struggling. And especially for those struggling with caregiver fatigue. for healing, for God's presence and intervention. And this is the last one I'll read for my, for Darby's niece, Brenna, to give permission for wings to fly in whatever direction she wants. Yes, yes, yes. All right, friends, um, let's bring up that slide. I want you to respond one more time for all of these prayers. The ones spoken aloud and the ones held in our hearts. God, hear our prayer. Amen. All right, friends, I am going to sing a closing song, one that I love to sing. Maybe you think I sing it too often, but I just love to sing it. It's called God is Good, and it's like a blessing and a song all rolled up into one. Um, 
May you receive it this morning. I'm going to sing it a couple of times. So may you receive it. And maybe you could even think of somebody else in your life who needs a blessing um, as you sing it a second or third time. The lyrics will be up momentarily. Oh, Abel, you need to share a different screen. So reshare and the presenter main output. Hey, there we are. Beautiful. Let's sing together. May your struggles. May your struggles keep you near the cross. May your troubles show that you need God. May your battles end the way they should. May your bad days prove that God is good. Let's sing that again. May your struggles. May your struggles keep you near the cross. May your troubles show that you need God. And may your battles end the way they should. May your bad days prove that. God is good. Let's sing that one more time. I love it. May your struggles. May your struggles keep you near the cross. And may your troubles show that you need God. And may your battles end the way they should. May your bad days prove that God is good. And may your whole life prove that God is good. Thanks, Matt. I'm going to offer a final blessing prayer to y'all. May you have the power in your inner being through the Spirit of God to know how high and how wide and how deep and how long the love of God is for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hey friends, it's great spending some time with you this late, beautiful Sunday morning. I hope you have the most fabulous of weeks. It's good spending time with you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Lydia. Thanks, Abel, running the sound and all that for us today. And thank you for being here. Have a good one. We'll see you next week.